All right, um, welcome to our lecture on backpropagation and CNNs. It's gonna be a lot of stuff that we're gonna talk about, um, like backpropagation and CNNs. So yeah, get excited. Uh, first, we have another large, largest GBMF. Raise your hand if you're in GB. Okay, That's okay. Fantastic. Same turnout as last time, just Prem and I. But anyway, if you want some details, Check it out. I highly encourage you to do so. All right, so now we're gonna go through a quick recap of the neural network stuff we talked about last time. Take it away, your friend. All right, hello everyone. And hello, little people in the phone. So, neural networks. We talked about it last time, but a quick recap. It's a learning algorithm that's modeled on the brain. You can basically just like look up if you wanna see what it looks like. It's right there. Anyway, um, neural networks are made of neurons. Each one's a logistic regression model, which we also talked about last time. This is the sort of anatomy of a neuron, so to say. It's basically you have inputs, you multiply them by weights, you have a bias that you add to it, and then you plug it into an activation function and an output. In more detail, that basically means each neuron receives a certain number of inputs, we'll call it N. You multiply each one by a single weight, like each input is being X, up to x sub i, the weight would be w sub i. And then the inputs and weights are mapped directly, so you only have one per input. So it's like, um, direct, it's basically directly mapped. And then you sum that all up and you add a constant bias, b. And so for example, this two input neuron, you have inputs x1 and x2, weights w1 and w2. Your sum is gonna be x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus the constant b. Those expressions are all equivalent. That's the same exact thing I just said with uh, summation to generalize it to larger numbers of inputs. And then this down here, that's if you were to write it all as vectors, which is what we'll end up doing in actual like code. Finally, we take the sum, we pass it through an activation function, which basically introduces nonlinearity into the system. We'll talk about what that actually means in a little bit. So if you, like, if you wanna summarize all of it, your z value is your input vector times your weights, uh, you add, which is equivalent to the inputs times the weights and adding the bias, because remember, you take the bias and you put it into the weight vector. And then your result is gonna be the um, sigmoid, or some other activation function with z plugged into it, and, that you get, and there you get y. So some common activation functions include ReLU, leaky ReLU, sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, uh, basically, what these are is it's like uh, different ways of making your model nonlinear, which is to say, the reason we do that is because there's a concept in linear algebra that you've probably learned in 33a that basically, if you have a bunch of linear functions and you sort of compose them into a single function, the function is in fact representable by a linear function of its own. So you're not actually making the model any more complex if all of your neurons are just linear. So in order to fix that, we make so our neuron activations nonlinear, and then the function actually like increases in complexity. So when we connect it all up, even the network is made of several layers. The layers are made up of neurons, and in a fully connected layer, each neuron receives an input from the neurons in the layer before, and feeds its own output to the neurons in the layer after, to each and every one. And this is important, you should know this for later on, Neural networks learn optimally when the layers are fully connected. So when every neuron is connected to every other neuron. That's how you like, actually learn the best. So the first layer is the input layer. We represent it with the circles and the diagram at the very start, but no operations are performed. The middle layer is also known as hidden layers. That's where you actually like, do activations and you're multiplying your weights and things like that. And the final layer is the output layer. It's over in the far right. But basically, in classification tasks, this would be a softmax function, which we talked about last time. It could also just not have a softmax function, then it would be a little more like a continuous regression type thing. And the process of taking your inputs and passing them through the layers is known as forward propagation. When you take a trained model with all the weights already like determined through training, and you predict the outputs for a given input vector, this is known as inference. You use forward propagation use inference to basically train the model and then try to minimize its like errors. 
So this diagram, we had it last time. Yeah, so I guess, yes, hopefully you remember this from last time. Um, I guess this was just should have been reviewed. Does anyone like not understand something from last time or forget something that they want us to go over? <clears throat> okay, so this is our uh, model from last time. Uh, what we did is we previously calculated um, this value uh, using, you know, these, these weights, these inputs, and then the bias, and then we put it through the activation function, and we solve for all these, but we just did it like linearly, or we just did it like one at a time. Uh, and that, you know, isn't great when, you know, you're trying to code it, and you don't want to go through every neuron, like iterate through every neuron um, doing that. So uh, how are we going to do this cleanly? Uh, we're going to be using it with, we're going to be doing it with matrices. So this is a whole bunch of notation. Um, and it's gonna, this is what we're gonna use to represent all of these uh, operations mathematically. Um, so we're gonna have AL, which is gonna be a vector of activations from layer L. So what's gonna happen is uh, if say L is uh, one, this is gonna be the first layer. We don't count this as a layer, nothing happens here. Um, so this will be layer one. Uh, I guess this can be layer zero. Anyway, so this will be layer one, and it's whatever's coming out of these neurons is gonna be represented by AL. So the first position is gonna be the output of this neuron, second, or this one, that one, et cetera. Um, Z is gonna be the result um, of an output of a neuron before being put through the activation. Um, so, you know, um, so like this one I believe was negative before it got, uh, I believe this was negative one and then Relu brought it up to zero. So the Z, for, Z would be identical to, to A for this, but it would be, um, it would be one, or it would be negative one um, for that middle value. And then finally, uh, weight, uh, W of L is gonna be the weight matrix between layers L minus one and L. So W of two is gonna be uh, a weight matrix that's representing all of these weights right here. Um, and it's doing so in a very specific format to make uh, multiplication very easy. Uh, and that is where the, the J, K uh, value is gonna represent um, the weight from node of A of K from the previous, uh, from the previous uh, layer to um, the, the one in the next layer. So um, the rows, right, each row is gonna represent a uh, destination neuron and each uh, column is gonna represent the, a, um, input from the previous layer. Um, so hopefully that makes sense because we're gonna make you find everything. Um, does, is there any, before we have you do this example, are there any questions on how this works? Is that clear? It's a lot of like, it's kind of hard to see it like from this, but we can puzzle it out. Okay, so then let's do the example. Uh, so exercise one, um, can we find uh, W2, which is the one that I just talked about, um, and its dimensions. I'll give you guys a second to, to think about that. Um, would you guys, do you guys want like this slide or this one up? Is this slide posted here? Uh, no, I mean this- I can this, do that this, right now. This will be on. Um, this this will be on. This is from the previous lecture, but yeah. Here, I'll just post the slides right right now. Sure. Anyway, so does anyone have like have have an idea of what things are gonna things are gonna look like? So if we call this like node zero, one, and two, and we call this node zero and node one, right? Um, if we're going from node zero to node zero, uh, one is just gonna be in that position, so that should be like that like first position. Um, then, right, we said that the, um, that each column is representing a, um, each column is gonna be representing a source, like a node from the previous layer. Um, so uh, that means that two coming from this first node should be in the same column. So it should be like one, two. Then here, the next column is just going to be three, negative two. And it should be one, negative one, negative one. Make sure I'm not. Yeah. So that's what W2 is going to look like. 
Are there any questions on how we got that? Okay. The next one should be a little bit more straightforward. Um, so A1, and it's, what is A1 going to look like? Slides are posted, by the way. And PR links. Okay, well, now there's the answers that are also posted, praying. They're right. <laughs> so, quickly, oh, Freddie, would you like to answer? Is it not 101? It is 101. <laughs> and then, uh, what is Z2 going to look like? One negative one. One negative one, uh, and also just remember, there's no activation function in the last in the last uh, output. Um, you sometimes you'll you'll do like a custom thing like a softmax, but there, you're not going to put the last thing through like ReLU. Anyway, so uh, if we put it all together, um, we know that uh, Z2 is going to be a linear function of W2, A1, and B2. Uh, so how would you calculate uh, Z2 using these other symbols? Remembering what Z2 is. All right, Bobak. Do you have an answer? W2, A1 plus B2. All right, very nice. You could have just raised your hand if you had that just, you know, in your pocket. I'm just saying. Um, all right, yes. So that's what Z2 is going to look like. Uh, and uh, A2, and now we can, uh, like, so we can generalize this formula, right, for basically any layer. So we can get um, the like raw product from that layer using these values. And then we can also uh, get, uh, since we know that A of K is gonna be, we're using sigma, uh, this sigma as our activation function. You don't necessarily use sigma for activation. In fact, usually you're gonna use ReLU, um, but this is just for, you know, insert any activation there. Um, so it's gonna be the activation of Z, and we can just replace that, and then this is gonna give us our outputs for every layer, and we can just go do that write down the layers. All right, learning about learning. So now we're gonna talk real quick about BRAC propagation. Uh, so, so we've already talked right now about, um, you know, about like neurons and, and how this is, and like how things work when you've got a fully trained model. But now like how are you actually gonna train your model? Uh, and like what's the algorithm behind that? So to start out with, you're gonna need to see what do you have a model? Well, you could just pick random numbers for your model. And now this is what Prem would do. But wait, I don't think this is actually what Prem would say. That's because it's Agent Prem. Oh my god, he's so surprised. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. But uh, in my defense, Agent Prem isn't actually wrong because you know we have to start somewhere. So our initial weights probably will be random. We there um, in like in production in the production world, there are some like heuristics that you can use to find the best random distribution, but we're not going to talk about that because it's out of scope for us. So we'll stick to saying the initial weights are completely random. But to go from there, we have to figure out how we can actually take these random weights and convert them into something that's like, you know, learned. So the question is, where does training start? Last lecture, we talked about loss functions, which is basically the error for a, a single data point when you compare it to when you compare the inputs to what you expect the outputs to be. And of course, the cost function is the average of that for all the data points. So a trained neural network is one whose inferences minimize the cost function, make the cost function as small as possible. So we can start there. I created this sample neural network. You don't really need to worry too much about what the numbers are for now. We'll just walk through it real quick and just assume that we have a neural network with this structure with ReLU activations and inputs, biases, and weights initialized as shown here. I tried to keep the numbers as simple as possible. So also assume that our network inferred the output to be 0.9 for these two inputs, but the actual output that we want is 2.7. So like, if we have the uh, data set with labeled inputs and labeled outputs for every input, the actual label in the data set was 2.7, but when we passed it into our neural network with random weights, we got 0.9. Clearly, this is wrong, and we need to try and fix that. So what numbers in this network can we control to fix the output? Any ideas? Anyone? Sammy. Um, zeros, I guess? Well, not necessarily. We can cha actually change all the weights. And we can change, we basically we can change any number that isn't the output directly. Sure. So we can change the weights. First, first of all, we'll look at the weights that are directly like going into the last neuron, because that's what most directly controls the 
output value. We have three weights here, 0 0.5, negative 0 0.7, 0 0.3. We can just we need to figure out how we're actually going to change those so that the value of 0.9 increases to 2.7 or it gets as close as possible. So what this means is the weights that are associated with 0.9 and 1.5, which are in this case the value up top and the value at the bottom, they need to increase because you need to increase your final result and multiplying a positive number by a positive number, you know, increases uh, gets a positive number as well. So if we increase those weights, the final output will increase. However, we, want our, we also want our neural network to learn as fast as possible. So what this means is we need to also increase this bottom weight by more than we increase the top weight because the neuron of 1.5 actually contributes more to the final, you know, the final output. You can also note that um, the, the weight in the middle, it doesn't actually contribute to the output at all, at least for this data point, so we just don't change it or we pretend that it doesn't really matter. But yeah, so we should increase the, the weight at the bottom by a greater amount to basically reach our desired value of 2.7 faster. However, these weights at the end aren't exactly the only weights that we can change. Because we, can also, we also have all the weights in the second to last layer and all the neurons that are associated with them. So basically, this column right here. However, we can't control the neurons, so any ideas how we would actually change those neuron values? Shrugby. I don't know. I don't know. All good. So we change them by basically changing the weights and biases that contribute to them. So we have the basically everything that's highlighted in blue. So this column of arrows and then the three numbers up above each neuron. Again, changing the biases is pretty simple. It's a pretty. It's basically the same process. We look at the um, the neuron that's like that it's above and the weight that's con that it's being multiplied by. And we want our output of 0.9 to increase right down there. So biases associated with a positive weight should increase because, again, positive times positive. And then values associated with a negative weight should decrease. So what this means is our bias at the very top, the 0 and the 0.5 right here, those should increase because the weights they're being multiplied by are positive. Whereas here, the 0.3 bias should decrease because the weight being multiplied is uh, negative. So if you change it by, if you decrease it and multiply it by negative, the result will increase. Again, note that the bottom weight right here, or, or rather the weight in the middle, should change more because the magnitude of the weight uh, associated with it is greater. The point, the point seven is a stronger weight in the context of this model than the two around it. So it should actually, like, you should change your point three by a greater amount than you do the. 0.5 in the zero. And changing the weights follows the same, same exact process. We basically, we just have to consider the neurons before the layer as well. So any neurons that are, or any weights that are coming out of this eight neuron should change more than the ones that come out of the six neuron, because when you multiply the eight by that weight, it's a higher number. And it, therefore, that, like, that neuron changes faster if you change the weight associated with the eight. In addition, any weights that are going into the 0.9 should increase, and they should change more than those going into the 1.5 down here, because the 0.5 is a stronger weight, and therefore that neuron is, you know, it holds more power in the model. And finally, anything that goes into this node or this node should be positive, because their weights are positive. Does all that make sense so far? Any questions? Cool. So basically what we've been doing is we started at the final layer and we're propagating backwards through, through the neural network to modify each weight for this one training example. When we do actual backprop, we, when we do actual backprop, we just do that for every single data point, average the results, and that's one training iteration. Any questions there? Yeah. So that was sort of like the intuition behind backpropagation. Uh, we're going to go into math, like how this is actually implemented real quick, or af after this. Um, but you guys get the basic idea at this point. Anything else we want to go over? Okay. Well, the key to backpropagation is chain rule. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, how is this going to work? So, <clears throat> 
first we're just gonna talk about some like define these new constants. Capital L is gonna be the total number of layers. Um, so uh, so Z uh, of L is gonna be the basically the raw output of the last layer, um, right? And there's gonna be no activation function, so there'll be no A of L. But there will be an A of L minus one. Uh, cost function is gonna be the cost uh, that we're using to calculate our, you know, how well our model's performing. Uh, so that can will probably be something like uh, cross entropy loss for classification stuff. Um, and will probably be something different uh, when we actually start building pocket racers. Um, but we'll, for now, we'll just kind of assume it's cross entropy. Um, and we talked about that last time. Does everyone remember what cross entropy loss is? I saw your hand move. All I know is it has log in it. Yeah, sure. It has, it, yes, logs. It's just a sum of logs, and uh, you're multiplying the, uh, the y by it. So it's only, you only care about it if it's, if it's, uh, it's basically the log of the score of the correct value. If that makes sense. And then multiplying y plus n equal. But we talked about it last time, don't worry, go back. Anyway, so to understand the, this diagram real quick, this is, we're pretending that we have a neural network with only one node in every layer. Um, so here's like a node. Um, we we uh, have the activation, right? So we get the activation out of here. We're going to multiply it by weight. Uh, it's going to come into here. We're going to get our ZL. Um, then we're going to apply an activation function, sigmoid. Then we're going to multiply that by more weights, and then we're going to get our ZL, um, which is going to be our output. So this is what we're going to be dealing with. Okay. So we got to calculate the error for each node. Ultimately. Um, what we're going to want to do is we want to find um, del C, uh, del W, and del C, del B, right? Uh, in order to do our back propagation, right? That's what we did. We've been doing in lab four. Um, is we're finding, yeah, we're figuring out which direction we have to change our, our weights and biases. Um, but it's going to be pretty hard to do this. Um, just like we can't do this directly. So actually, what we're going to find is we're going to be finding del C, del uh, Z's, uh, and then we can use the chain rule to really easily find uh, the gradient with respect to. Uh, weights and biases. Um, but the very first and easiest thing to, to find is going to be del C, del Z of the last layer. Uh, so we're going to start with this. Um, using, and so, sorry, so this will just be straight up the gradient of our loss function, which is differentiable because we chose it to be. Um, now we're going to want to find the uh, gradient with respect to the second to last node, uh, which again we're going to be doing with the chain rule. So right, we've got um, we've found our uh, del z, our our, uh, our derivative with respect to the last the last node, uh, but now we want to find it with respect to the second to last node, and we can chain rule this out, um, and we're going to multiply all of these values uh, together, um, and each of these should be pretty easy to find. We should know what they are because uh, here right we know what our activation function is, so that's going to be just that the gradient of that. Um, and then this is just going to be like that linear, um, this is just going to be like W, right? Because that's, that's uh, what is coming out of there. So this slide is going to very clearly, hopefully, show uh, what I'm talking about, um, right? So Z of L is going to be the activation from the previous layer times the weight, or the single weight, because we're do only doing one, um, one neuron per layer. And we get this value is just going to be the activation of the raw input, or the raw output of this previous neuron. So uh, we can find all that, and we can just substitute in these values. So del C to L depends on our loss function. Um, WL is just gonna be the, the gradient uh, with respect to AL, right, the AL goes away. And then this is just gonna be the gradient of our uh, loss function. Is everyone following so far? It's, it's, hope, it's just chain rule. Um, yeah, just kind of chain it back. Okay, um, so we can actually generalize this to any neuron. We just replace the big L's with this fancy little swirly L, and we're golden. Um, this is like literally the same equation with just that. Um, and we can recursively work our way back through the array to find the gradient of the cost function with respect to any node in the uh, in the network, and this is more of like a conga line, but you know whatever. Okay, um, <clears throat> and then this is the slide from before, just with curly L's. Um, 
All right, so how do we actually find the weights and biases? Um, well, fortunately for us, more chain rule. Uh, if we want to find the, this with respect to the weight, we can calculate uh, the gradient with respect to ZL, which we just figured out how to do. And then we can figure out the gradient of ZL with respect to W, um, since, as you recall, um, this uh, ZL is going to be the activations from the previous layer um, times these, uh, just times the weights. So we should get something that looks very straightforward and linear. Um, and that is what we get. Um, we just take the values we calculated previously and multiply them. Hold up. <laughs> I think, all right, this, this is supposed to be an A to the L minus one. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so right, if we're taking the gradient of Z, um, that's gonna, with respect to W, that's gonna get rid of this part, and we just get the A, A to the L minus one, which we got during forward propagation. All right, my bad. Does anyone understand why this is wrong? Okay. Wait, what's this supposed to be? Is this, this is supposed to be A to the L minus one. Right, because this this is just this, right? Uh, DZL with respect to uh, DZL DWL, um, and then this is um, this is DZL. So when you take it with respect to WL, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, the the W should go away. So my bad. Um, we will change this. Okay. Um, does everyone understand now how this is going to work for our very simple neural network with one node? In every, in every one. Okay, hopefully this isn't too complicated because um, we're going to make it a little bit more complicated, but not too much. Because uh, now, if we have a more complicated neural network with a bunch of nodes, um, basically, like, you know, we just do the same thing and now we keep track of our uh, del C, del Z, L's as vectors. Uh, and, and we can also just kind of change all of our notation from before into matrices um, and it'll work out. But uh, we're going we're gonna to define this new delta, um, and this delta is going to be a vector of uh, gradients with respect to the different layers, um, or with respect to the different nodes in a layer. So this is going to be all the gradients for layer L, uh, and this is going to be the gradient for the first node, the second node, the third node, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're going to use this basically just to rewrite our previous um, our previous um, function, our previous equations, now using uh, matrix notation. Um, so this is the definition. So this is how we're going to backpropagate through and get all the um, all the deltas, um, and then we can use these deltas. Oh, it's right here. Yeah, and we can use all the deltas to get. Um, we can use all the deltas to get the weights and the biases for each for each term. Um, So um, one thing to note is if you notice this weird little dot thingy here, uh, that's called the Hadamard product. It's very simple. Um, it's what you think matrix multiplication could be, should be before you take linear algebra and realize that it's not. Um, you're just like element-wise multiplying everything together. So if I were to take the Hadamard product of these two vectors, I just sort of multiply their values element-wise and get through three, three and eight. Um, I think that's it. Do you guys have any questions about all that? No. You guys, we talked about this in 147, right? Okay, I've not watched that lecture yet. <laughs> how, did, how did we do compared to Cal? This is like the last lecture. <laughs> <laughs> really? How do we do compared to Cal? I like this more. You like this more? Okay. All right. Fills my heart I think with joy. I think our chain rule slide is better. Oh, I agree. Did he have a chain rule slide? <laughs> Sorry, Mickey, this is what I was doing when I wasn't helping you. I was making the chain rule slide. <laughs> I like how you can tell which slides are kind of right. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you can tell. Okay, I, I'm pretty sure you're talking now. Yeah, but I thought we were giving them a break. Are we giving, do you guys want a break? It's been like half an hour, probably. Yeah, they're not answering, so we just plow through. All right, sounds good. <laughs> All right, so now on to the fun stuff. CNNs. Uh, something news network, neural network, I don't know. I mean, I just work here. Anyway, so neural networks. This is a problem with them. If we want to try and train our car 
to avoid walls and whatnot, taking camera input and all that. It takes an image. The image is like a giant grid of, I don't know, 600 by 600 or whatever we had. And you pass that into a neural network that looks like this. There, that's not gonna work for a number of reasons. First of all, this is what we call an artificial neural network, also known as a fully connected neural network. We also typically just call it a neural network. But point being, these neural networks work well when the features are all related to each other, but they're also like distinct. So for example, in this case, we have a neural network that's detecting if something is a dog. It takes in the number of legs as a number. It takes whether or not it wags its tail as a binary input. It throws that into a hidden layer and out comes the output. This is a dog. However, when you try to pass an image into a neural network, it starts getting a little fuzzy. So one might say, images are just an array of pixels. What if each pixel was just three input neurons, you know, for red, green, blue? And by one, of course, I mean IEEE officers who skipped the last lecture would say something like this. Hi, Isha. Anyway. So the problem with neural networks. A 100 by 100 image, for example, that would yield 30,000 inputs. Because, you know, 100 times 100, and then you have three channels. 30,000 inputs into your neural network. That is a lot of inputs. And in our car example, we had like a camera that picks up 640 by 480 or something like that. That's an even bigger, even more absurd number. It's something like 240,000. We don't really care about every single pixel in this image, even though I know the dog is fantastic, but we don't really care about all the pixels in there. What we're trying to do is condense this image into something that gives us the overall idea of what the dog is. Just like how in the previous like fully connected neural network, we didn't have like a bajillion meaningless features. We just had a few that we actually cared about, like the number of legs and wagging its, whether or not it wagged its tail. So like if the, if, for example, if this image were higher resolution, imagine how many inputs it would have, it would be absurd. The second problem is we need meaningful connections between our inputs. Like I said, or the neural networks we talked about earlier, they're fully connected, meaning when all the features are related, they work well. But for images, this is not the case. We have like a variety of pixels throughout this image. Like if you see this one and this one right here, those two pixels aren't really related, so it doesn't make sense to pass them both into the same input, the same neuron in the hidden layer. And all you're doing is sort of inferring connections between pixels that don't exist. So not only is it like better from an an actual learning perspective if we don't relate those two pixels, it's more computationally efficient. So we can make this network faster if each pixel is only related to the ones around it. So what that means is we need, we need a mathematical operation of some sort where you take a pixel in this image and you perform some operation on it that only involves the pixels around it. Does anyone remember what that mathematical operation is? Jonathan. Okay. Hey. Hey, you close that laptop. <laughs> no, it's fine. No. Okay, I'll just. The answer is convolution, and we will. We are about to get into our convoluted explanation of convolution. Yes. All right. We talked about this before. Quick review. Um, we have this kernel. We want to convolve it over this. We take it. We overlay it. We multiply all the terms, and boom, we add them up, and we get an output. Or at least that's what we're doing here. Um, reality convolution is just like the, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so this is. Sorry, so this is what convolution is looking like. We talked about this in fall. Um, but there's something different uh, about this. Can anyone tell me why this isn't actually convolution? Anyone who's not looking at the slides? <laughs> Jackie. Um, I'm not sure. Mm, OK, well, uh, if you recall, how did it, what, it, what were like the two steps of doing convolution like, like you know, on, on pen and paper or, or like, there's two things that we, we said you had to do when you were uh, when you were like trying to draw out your convolution convolutions. Does anyone recall? Invert. You have to you have to like invert the kernel. Yeah, yeah. Flip and drag. So we're not flipping. So basically, the point here is just to quickly say that CNNs, the convolution in CNNs, is kind of a misnomer. It's actually something called correlation, which is you know, when you put it over. But everyone calls it convolutions, and we're going to do that too. But, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, it's fun. OK. <clears throat> so con convolutions with images, um, we're going to go through. We've already, you know, we already covered convolutions. So we're just going to really quickly go over um, 
like you know, uh, some terms. So we got each, each of these RGBs is called the channel. Uh, a filter is this entire three-dimensional thing, and then each uh, of the little, each um, piece that fits over one, one channel is a kernel. So um, like this little part right here is gonna be a kernel, a kernel, a kernel, you stack them together, and you're gonna get a three-dimensional filter, which you're then gonna just kind of convolve along the, um, along the image. Um, then you're gonna get an output, so you know, it's here, or when our filter's here, it's gonna multiply, we're gonna add it together, we're gonna get this output, then we're gonna move it over, we're gonna do it again, we're gonna get another output, that's gonna build up a two-dimensional uh, array of numbers called a feature map. Um, and then, one thing to talk about grayscale, you know, you can use grayscale, you know, like different numbers of channels, um, I don't know, so if you're working with different things like polarized light or grayscale images or RGB, yeah, it'll, it'll vary. Um, and you know it can make things you know you'll have less information, but it can make things simpler. Um, though it's not as big of a deal as it was when we talked about it before. Um, so uh, an important thing to so this is again kind of looking at how it's going to look in three dimensions. Um, where here we've got our red kernel convolving over the red channel, green, green, blue, blue. Uh, we're going to add all the values. You know we take the values, we add them all up. We're going to add a bias term, and then we're going to get output. Um, we'll also have an, add an activation to this output, um, or yeah. And then, so an important thing to think about is like each of these elements, each of these numbers, you can think about as a weight. Uh, it's, and they're going to be trained using back back propagation as before, just with weights. And you can think about it like a fully connected network. Um, just it's not fully connected anymore. Um, you can probably try and draw it out. Um, like to see what it would look like, but it'll still just be you know a network with a bunch of layers uh, and You know, they'll just be connected differently, uh, but it's not really it's Difficult to think about that. Um, so a quick intuition as to what features are doing or what filters are doing uh, So if we have this grayscale image uh, and we have a filter that looks like this uh, It has like high numbers kind of like in this curve area and low numbers everywhere else uh, and say whenever, uh, when we have the filter and say we put it right here, right, it's not going to be very much, you know, these are all going to be zero, so our output's going to be zero. If we say take it and like put it right here, uh, right, we're going to have like this white band kind of going through here. So we'll have like some small values here, you know, not, nothing really that groundbreaking. But then when we put it right here, you can see that this, um, this little edge is going to line up with the large numbers in the filter. So we're going to get a really high value when we're at this when we're at this point. So you can think of filters like they're looking for features and they're gonna output really high values um, where, the features are, uh, where the features are present and lower values where they're not. And that kind of makes sense why it's called a feature map, right? You have a feature map um, and then you're gonna look at it and you're gonna be like, oh look, there's a bunch of high numbers here. There's gotta be some features there. Look at that. Um, yeah. So uh, here we can see it on different images. It's gonna be very good at recognizing mice uh, but then, you know, you try and put it on a box and nope, all like edges and corners and stuff. So, you know, you're not going to get anything from that. Um, all right. So now we talked about, you know, what will happen. You have one filter that you're going to convolve over an image. Um, but at each like layer, you might want to have multiple filters, uh, right? Because a filter is going to, each filter will look for one feature. But, you know, you, you don't really want to like get your feature map and you get one feet you get a feature map of one feature and then you maybe like convolve over that again that's not going to give you enough information so we're going to use a bunch of different layers um, and so each layer is going to create a two-dimensional feature map and then we're going to stack the feature maps together into a feature space Woo! okay so we're going to quickly quickly just you know think about the dimensions that we're getting here um, you're going to have a three-dimensional input. That'll be your image or your feature space from the previous layer. You're going to have a bunch of three-dimensional filters whose uh, width is going, whose depth, whose depth is going to match that of the input. They will then convolve over the input and produce a bunch of two-dimensional feature maps for each, uh, for each filter. And then you're going to stack these feature maps, and you're going to get your output for your convolutional layer. Um, OK, are there any questions right now? about how convolution is going to work. OK. Um, sweet. So let's talk about zero padding. I don't remember what we actually said about this before. 
You guys remember, did we say anything about this in the fall? Like how zero padding works? Okay, well, what you may or may not notice is that when we went go back all the way up to here, we have a four by four input and we're convolving a three by three kernel with it and we get a two by two output. And like, what is that? That is not cool is what that is. We are losing information and we're also like, and this information we don't want to lose, we do want to lose some information, we'll talk about that later, but we're like in losing information around the edges and like our featured space is getting really small. Um, so yeah, that's, that's not cool. So what we do is we just do zero padding and we just pad the edges with zeros. Um, and then when we convolve over it, uh, we can actually get to the edges and we can get more values and we look for features at the edges. Um, and yeah, and then this way we can maintain the dimensionality um, in our feature map and our uh, input. So generally when zero padding, um, you can technically do whatever you want to do and add as many zeros as you want, but common practice is to try to make the dimensions of your input the same as the dimensions of your output. So you have to look at a bunch of different things and you have to look at the, um, you, in order to figure out how wide your output's gonna be, you have to look at the width of your input, um, the width of your filter, um, P is gonna be the padding amount and then S is gonna be the step size. So this is gonna be an equation that you might wanna like refer back to. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense like staring at it. Whenever I do it, I just kind of visualize it in my head with like a very small input width. Um, but you can also use this function um, if you're really not sure. Um, anyway, as, is there any questions on zero padding? Why we do it, how we do it, where we do it. Okay. Um, cool. So uh, a real quick thing, we're going to talk about some hyperparameters now uh, that are present in your uh, in your convolutional layers. Um, so first is going to be the step size. So when you make a convolutional layer in um, PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever you know whatever uh, library you're using, um, you're going to want to find the step size. So that's going to be how much the filter moves each time before you get your uh, next, before you get your next uh, like out, uh, element, your feature space, uh, how big the filter is, um, how many filters you're going to use. So that's going to be like you know how how deep the feature space is, and then how much zero padding you're going to want to use. Um, so these are the things that you're going to be controlling. Okay. Pausing here for questions. Yes. So is the value of the kernels and all the trains the gradient descent and the frag computation? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, so you can like think about it like it's just not fully connected, but it's still like a neuron, like each, all right, I'm gonna draw something really messy on the board here. I love whiteboards, everyone loves whiteboards. All right, so you've got like your image, right? And then we'll just say it's grayscale. And so you've got like a, Friggin' three by three kernel. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? And you're gonna like kind of like move that along. Uh, you can look at that as like in a regular network, like, um, you know, you've got your inputs, um, you know, one, two, three, dot, 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 nine, dot, 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 all the way down for however big this thing is. And then you've got your, um, your kernel. So the kernel at this position will be represented by one node. Uh, so this will be the kernel here. Do you want a better marker? Uh, yeah, this marker's pretty bad. I, I, there's more markers here. Printed. They're all bad. They're all bad? Yeah. Here you go. Okay, let's fill, let's fill them out then. Why do people keep putting bad markers back? That one's okay. Okay, um, right, so then this node, right, can represent the output of this kernel. So it's going to get an input from all of these things, but not from the rest down here. Um, and then, right, and then you, like, shift the kernel over here. Um, and this is going to be another node, and you're going to get the weights here. Um, the one interesting thing, I'm not 100% sure how this would work, um, is that like all these weights have to be the same. Um, so, yeah, that's something. But yes, you do train it through back propagation. Yeah. I would add that the weights don't necessarily have to be the same. It's just the convolutional filter that you apply that produces the. Well, dot down there 
is going to be the, um, the numbers and that. No, no. These oh. these weights have to be the same as these if these are represented by the same filter. Mm, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so. But yeah, the numbers in the convolutional filter that's what gets trained by the um, backprop. I don't know. Yeah. No, no one ever like you know talked about it to me this way. I just was like. I don't know. Yes, it is trained through backpropagation. You kind of think about it as just like being wired up really weirdly and in a way that doesn't make sense unless you think about it in the context of kernels and stuff. Um, yes. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Back to this. So, now you've probably heard of this before. We've complained back in the localization lecture that sometimes the images are just too many numbers and we want to get rid of some numbers. And so now we're going to talk about how we do that here. But in the case of convolutional neural networks, the, impl the implications are a bit more severe. So remember what we talked about in the previous lecture. If the model is too complex, what happens? Which, basically, which is to say, if we're extracting way too many features out of our image, if we're finding features that don't really make sense, so if the model is too complex, does anyone remember what happens to our model? Anyone? It Isha? Overfits. Very good, it overfits. So if our feature maps are too detailed, they have too many numbers in them, they're too intricate, we're going to overfit our model on features that don't actually make sense. So like if it sees a random, a, like a random uh, scatter of dots like in one corner that don't actually mean anything, but they're just kind of there because of noise or whatever, and the model is able to detect that, that's a problem, and it will overfit. So the solution to this, we talked about this as well in the localization lecture, reducing the image space, the downscaling algorithm to be precise, where we basically take a window of pixels, we apply an operation to them, and we put the result in a new matrix, and we slide the window over, does anyone know what that operation is called? We talked about it like tw 20 slides ago. Max pooling. No, that's the next slide, or a little bit later. But the answer is it's a convolution, where the weights are all one, like, oh. one over whatever. The step size is that. And then, yeah, it's a convolution. Or it's a kind of convolution. Anyway, so what this actually does, or what it's called in CNNs, is average pooling which is to say it averages the cells under the kernel and puts them in a new matrix, then it moves on, rinse and repeat. And this reduces the number of values in your feature map. It's basically, it's basically just downscaling it. You guys have seen this before. However, with CNNs, we can't really just downscale like that. There's a little bit of a problem with it. Does anyone have any idea what it is? Okay. What if I told you that you had a feature map like this, uh, number two? An average pooling would look roughly like this. Because you're averaging the pixels together, you average a white and a black pixel, and suddenly it's gray, and all the white is gone. So now think about what would happen if you did this like too many times, if you average pooled over and over and over. Eventually, your feature map is just going to disappear entirely. So like, we don't really want that in our CNN. We want it to be able to actually detect things, and we can't do that if the weights in our convolutional filters are just like almost zero for all of them. So the question is, can we do better? Does anyone have an idea of how we could do better? How about now? Um, after we take a look at this diagram, which is so, uh, so eloquently drawn by not me, uh, we, take, we take the feature map, which has a bunch of large numbers, we pull it together, we want our result to still have large numbers in it. So what kind of pooling filter do you guys think would keep the large numbers? Freddie. Max pooling. That's crazy. So yeah, max pooling. As the name suggests, you take the maximum of the cells in the kernel, you stick them in the new matrix. It's not really a convolution because it's not like you're multiplying and flipping and dragging or just multiplying and dragging. But the point being is it's like a convolution and it does the trick here. If you'll notice, if you, if you um, remember from fall quarter, it's very similar to thresholding where if you have high numbers in your region, they stay high. And if you have lower numbers, only like low numbers in your region, they stay low. The only difference is with thresholding, you do that for every individual pixel. For max pooling, you do it over regions of pixels. 
So with the same feature map from before, the number two, a max pooling filter would look like that. And the result is much nicer because the weights are still high. You can still actually you know, train them and produce results. And it's much better in general. So now that we've talked about that, it's time for the big finish, AKA finding that connection, which I don't think any of us engineers know how to do. But anyway, so what have we done so far? We've used a set of convolutional filters to find and preserve features in the image. We then pass them through an activation function, whether it's sigmoid, ReLU, what, what have you. You introduce non-linearity into the neural network. You apply the max pooling filter that basically condenses it down while also keeping the high values in the point pixels. And you do this as many times as necessary until you have a bunch of features that you are trying to extract out of the image. The question is, what's next? The answer is, we've already established that a neural network must be fully connected in order to learn the best. We talked about this a couple times earlier in this lecture. So what we can do now is if we have a CNN that basically has a rough idea of where the important features in the image are, we can then pump those into a fully connected neural network and it will actually learn those features and convert them into the final output result. In practice, you don't actually have two separate networks, you just have a bunch of convolutional layers and a bunch of fully connected layers, and they're connected to each other. In order to do this, you also have to flatten, which means you take your grid-like input and convert it into a 1D vector output. You can just think of it as like taking these columns and like stacking them on top of each other. The main thing is, the reason this works is that you can think of the image features that the convolutional layers detect as like numbers when they come out, right? Because the convolution, it just produces a bunch of numbers by doing a mathematical operation. And we know that fully connected neural networks, they learn optimally when all the, neural, all the neurons are connected and they learn, of course, from numbers. So if you like have a string or something or you have to convert it into a number and pass it in. So the point being here, fully connected networks are better at learning from numbers. Convolutional layers are better at actually taking an image and converting that into numbers that the network can use. They work as a team. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Cool. What's this? What else? All right. Mm. Fun. All right. Um, I guess. When did the recording stop? I do not know. Yikes. I've okay. Not, I've not touched it. Um, we'll